Why do you think people are scared to ask for the check? Yeah, I think most people are scared to ask for the check or talk about money because most of their model of the world and their beliefs were cultivated between zero and seven years old when your brain was in theta state. And when you were a little boy or a little girl, you heard, we can't afford that. And money doesn't grow on trees. And rich people are evil. And they probably screwed someone over for that Lamborghini. And so at a little boy, a little girl, you believe that money was hard to make. Yep. You believe that you couldn't afford it. Or in my household in specific, money was a hush-hush topic. Yep. We don't talk about money. Don't let anyone know how much money you have or how little money you have, right? right? And so then money becomes taboo. And I love why you're, the mission of this podcast yep. is to make it uh, a common a common conversation, right? And so oftentimes, your relationship with money isn't yours. It got thrown onto you. Hmm. Uh, you picked it up along the way. It's not yours. And so I tell people most of your elevation and personal development is going to be coming from unlearning the BS that you've been taught by the wow. matrix and by the world and by your parents. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to a very, very, very special edition of the Money Mondays. This is going to be my easiest interview ever because the questions I'm going to ask, I want to know. You guys are going to like to hear about it, but I actually have these questions because this is one of the few humans in the world that I look up to. I deal with a lot of influencers, celebrities, athletes, business people, etc. But Adam Weitzman, deep in his soul, is one of the best humans I've ever met in my life. And so I've got some serious questions. Please welcome Mr. Adam Weitzman. Good morning. <laughs> Ooh. And the crowd goes wild. <laughs> ah! We are co-hosted by the real Tarzan. I gotta make animal noises again, like. Ah, ah. <laughs> so, if, as you guys know, the real Tarzan gets over 200 million views a month doing animal content and helping with animal preservation. We've created the Wild Jungle together out there in Temecula, California. 26 acre ranch. If you ever want to come visit, we'll be ready soon. But our first guest is gonna be Adam Weitzman. He's gonna be there with his kids. No, I can't wait to come out. The place looks crazy. I can't wait to see it. So the way the Money Mondays works, as you guys know, is we keep it very short and effective to 40 minutes. We do three topics, how to make money, how to invest money, and how to give it away to charity. Adam is one of the most philanthropic people that I know as well, so that's going to be a really good segment. But let's start off with a quick two or three minute bio, and we'll get straight to the money. Um, my name's Adam Whiteman. Um, I'm in the scrap metal recycling business. That's the core business. Um, I've sort of diversified in the last couple of years, so... I sit on the board of directors of 40 different companies. Um, I'm partners in 41 different companies of just all, you know, various things from bio to tech, um, just to try to, you know, diversify as sure. things go, you know, forward in the future. Yep. Um, so it's it's been a pretty interesting ride and, you know, learning things every day and it's more just investing in people yep. than just the idea. So if I find somebody that I really believe in, um, you know, I'll, I'll basically fund any idea right. as long as I, you know, have trust and faith in the person. Very cool. So how did you get into that business? Um, I, the recycling scrap metal in the steel business, I've been doing for like 30 something years. Wow. It was an offshoot. Um, my family was in like auto parts. Yep. And then I sort of, you know, when I got into it, I sort of morphed it into something different based on market conditions. You know, there's some hard times along the way. So yep. definitely, you know, had to pivot. And, you know, I liked recycling. You know, I liked, you know, sustainability and things like that. So. So for the listeners out there, they're from all different categories of entrepreneurs and also entrepreneurs, people that are working a job that want to be an entrepreneur. When they're thinking about their decision of how to make money or how to get a job or how to pick a career or a brand to work with, what do you think it takes for someone to decide and make that decision of, I want to work for this company or start my company or work with this brand? I don't know if you have to decide that fast because, you know, things with me sort of change as it goes. But I think the key is, is, you know, do what you really like, but you have to go full on. You know, you can't really half-ass anything these days. The competition's so tough. Yeah. There's never been, you know, the people that I'm going up against are smarter, faster, you know, better, edu better educated. So you have to really try to be on your A game, you know, at all times. And you know, that's why I never really, like, kind of drinking drugs or anything, just because I always wanted to be on my, you know, A game as much as I could. So when you have... 40 different companies to think about as you know as an advisor and an investor and then you have your core business how do you decide from a time management perspective what are you going to work on is it is it like ebbs and flows of times or do you have like this is my strict regimen no i'm very like big into time management so like i'll have you know itinerary broken down for the whole day so i know pretty much you know i have some assistance of course that thank god that helped me out i couldn't do it <laughs> but the, with the time <laughs> management and stuff it's um i just know what the flow is um so i try not to waste much time because there isn't much time in the day to waste yeah you know, I'm down in Miami for five days, probably have like 25 to 30 meetings. So it's like going one to another to another and, you know, just trying to see really good people and learn as I go. You know, I've learned a lot from you guys. You know, we went to Africa together, which was, uh, I learned so much there. And uh, 
So I try to take away a little something from every single meeting. Sergeant, how do you decide? You got so many things going on. You have 85 animals to feed. You got the world to showcase your content to. Like, how do you decide on your time? Well, that's a good thing. Um, I, I'm always around you guys and other people, and I always ask, you know, what makes you guys get to that next level? And you guys always tell me time management, discipline. So spreading your time towards animals, you got to see who's high maintenance, who's low maintenance. You know, some animals I can feed once a week, once a month, like a snake or a lizard, you know. And some animals like our baby zebras and, you know, small giraffes, they got to eat. They got to be on a bottle every, every couple hours. Every time you walk hours. by them, they yell at you, yeah, food, me, food, food, you got more food. <laughs> You're like, you know? it's been 20 minutes. <laughs> yeah, so you have your little small niche of animals. I try to keep it at a minimum, you know. Um, and, and when I have, like, a lot of babies or something like that, uh, my travel is to a minimum. When I, like, say winter time, I have a lot of free time, you know, so I could travel around the world. Winter time, like, you know, we're in Africa in yeah, December, you know, we can go for three weeks or a month at a time. So it's good, man. I love it. But time management is very, very key. So, Adam, I'm going to ask you an emotional question. Is there a number, age, or a goal that you would just stop? You would retire and that's it, not work anymore? I, I don't really think so because I'd be bored. I don't have too many hobbies. So, like, you know, doing investing in new businesses is kind of like a hobby. So it is kind of my retirement. I'm getting up there. Like, I'm 54. You guys are like kids, you know. So, <laughs> like, um, but I don't think there's, like, a retirement age. But definitely um now i'm just funding you know other people's ideas which you know i'm like i'm on their board of directors and things like sure. that but it, they're putting a lot of the work into yeah it. so in a way i'm slowing up that way but the core business is still the one that funds everything so i still have to be like all in on that so i've never worked more hours in my life so wow i thought it was going to be different as i right. got older but it, the plan <laughs> <laughs> the plan went the opposite so yeah, so all of us here have a lot of mutual friends from entertainers, athletes, influencers, everybody between. Some of them go on to become very wealthy and like control their money like a Jake Paul that actually you see him building up wealth, building up fame, but it doesn't look like he's one of those kids that's going to go broke compared to other athletes and influencers we watch make a lot of money, spend a lot of money, and then fade away into oblivion. What do you think the difference is between someone that's financially sound and that's going to waste away their money like a lot of athletes that go broke? Well, like using Jake Paul, like Jake Paul, I invested as one of his original investors his fund, in his yeah. fund. Anti-fund. Anti-fund with Jeff Wu, like yep. the best guys. Yep. And uh, in the beginning, I was just like, you know, this is not going to be right. good. You know, <laughs> I didn't know Jake at that time very sure. well. But, you know, I thought he was really smart. But, yep. you know, he's a little crazy on camera. Sure. But off camera, the guy's methodical. He's yep. very smart. Jeffrey's brilliant. Sure. Uh, that ended up to be dollar for dollar, probably my best investment Wow. of that year wow. for sure that's awesome uh, they crushed it yeah um so it just i think the difference with him is you know his persona is there's two different jake pauls the jake paul you know you and i've seen behind yep. the scenes is generous caring yep. smart and then you have the the character the character yeah. jake paul which is you know kind of crazy <laughs> yeah, and everything <laughs> but as a friend there is no better friend than him that guy reaches out he checks in yep. never asks me for anything yep. that guy's never asked for Yep. I think, you know, and I was the one that said I'd like to invest in their fund. They didn't like pitch me or anything like that, you know, so um, I just I'm big fans of Jake, big fans of his family. Yep. And uh, Jeff Wu is just, you know, the real deal. Yep. brilliant Stanford guy, like, yep. you know, crazy, wicked that's smart. A, that's what you want, right? Yeah. Running a fund. So let's actually walk through investment funds. That's one of the things and topics I've wanted to talk about on these episodes, but we have you and I have invested into different funds. So I created a fund a couple of years ago called the Elevator Rolling Fund. I created a rolling fund structure, which is backed by a company called AngelList. AngelList does billions of dollars of transactions. AngelList is the biggest and it comes to syndications and funds. So let's walk through a syndication and a fund. So I created Elevator Syndicate. I have 846 investors in Elevator Syndicate. They don't invest into the syndicate. They invest optionally into deals that I invest into. So what happens is I send out a text or an email to the Elevator Syndicate. So let's say Adam and Tarzan, you get a text, ding. Dan is investing $200,000 into this food brand. And then you d decide if you want to respond, I'll put in 25K, 50K, 100K, 500K, or zero. If you're going to put in zero, you don't respond to anything. And so syndication deals, last year we did $44 million of investments through syndication deals. Food and beverage brands, consumer products, a lot of things that Jake and Jeffrey will invest into as well. Things that we can help, food and beverage and consumer products. So for those of you listening, there are syndicate groups that are out there that Jason Calacanis has He's, his is the largest group out there. I think there's like 6,000 members um, where you can invest optionally into deals. So let's say Adam's like, yeah, I'm going to throw in 200K. Travis, or, uh, Tarzan's going to throw in 100K. Travis is going to throw in 200K. Well, our friends are going to throw in 100K, 200K. 
you can fund a deal through a syndication. Outside of that is a fund. There are different types of funds. A rolling fund structure that Angelus created is where people can invest quarterly over the course of time and they can go up or down after 12 months. It's a really interesting structure. If you are a solo entrepreneur, so let's say you have one to three people that work with you and you want to start a fund, a rolling fund structure through Angelus is the easiest way for you to do it because they cover the legal, they cover the headache, etc. A traditional fund, which is what most people will do when you hear about like Sequoia Capital and those type of huge uh, VCs, those are where you have to lock it up for 10 years. You have to have a minimum net worth of X, Y, Z, and you have to be, you have to be able to have a get away to get in because usually those funds are like their seventh fund. It's hard to get in and they want you to put in 5 million, 10 million, 20 million, 50 million dollars. So when you guys are out there considering as you're going through the stages of life, you start to make 50 grand a year, then hundred grand a year, then 500 grand a year, or $2 million or some big exit happens. And you want to look at syndications or funds, do your research about it. Angelus is one of the best companies to look at to do your research about it and then make decisions like, Adam just said about the person. Jake was the marketing figure behind Anti-Fund, but then he had Jeffrey Wu to back it up because this guy is a real Ivy League guy that's gonna actually run the operation. So make sure you guys do your research when deciding between a fund, a syndication, or any type of investment, but look at the people that are running it and look at their background and track record. Adam, how do you decide what funds to invest into? Like a real estate fund, a tech fund, an anti-fund, et cetera. How do you make those decisions about where to deploy capital? Well, I'm just trying to diversify, so I'm, I'm not trying to put more than 10 percent in any any one thing in any one thing yep. for sure and another thing today with the internet and social media you see these things are like home run returns i'll put a little into something like that right. but that's not the real life right that's and not real life <laughs> it's really not and you have to be conservative conservative is the key you know yep. the, the slow and steady is really what's built it up today it was never the sure there's a couple small home runs along the way but there was a couple of disasters of years along the well yep. way. So I think a lot of it is, you know, you want to, you want to, you don't want, if people promise you returns that are too good to be true. Probably is. It, it is. And yeah. we've seen, you know, crypto and yep. a lot of stuff. There was so many scams during yeah. that time. Like NFT so scams. many people got yeah. NFTs. So many people got destroyed, like right. literally destroyed. Yeah. And um, I try to guide people away from that stuff. You know, you can put your fun money in that stuff for exactly. sure. Right. And it's, you might get a good hit. You've done some really good ones along the way. Yep. Um, but a lot of people that don't have the inside knowledge of some of these things are gonna get really crushed. For sure. So I always say buyer beware. Yep. So. so my speech about investing, which is the main speech that I do throughout the year is called 40, 40, 20. 40% 40 low risk, 40% medium risk, 20% shot at glory, high risk. Yeah. And even from that 20%, it's not to put all 20% into one high risk project. Someone's like, I'm doing the new orange t-shirt NFT. Don't put all 20% of your capital into that one thing because who knows if it works out. And sometimes even when things work out, the people that invested are too late. Yeah. So you hear the hype or you hear the new thing that's happening and this rapper's promoting it and this athlete's promoting it. It goes from $1 to $12 and you're like, oh my God, it's amazing. They invested the $12 mark and then bad stuff happens. And so as Adam just mentioned, buyer beware, keep in mind when you're investing the things think about the stage of where it's at sometimes you're coming in a bit too late if you're hearing about it everywhere you're probably too late because everyone's talking about it and a lot of the huge nft returns happen for people that came in early or midway sure. through the people that lost a lot of money came in at, towards the end and they're investing at the peak or at the the downfall time frame Great. and so keep in mind as you're listening to the people that are out there you're seeing marketing for nfts cryptocurrencies etc those are your shot at glory those are your biggest chances but if you're going to do that, put in a small amount of money, throw in $100, $1,000, $2,000, some small affordable amount for you. If it works out, fantastic. If it doesn't, you're not going to miss out on rent the next month. Yeah, at least by an NFT that you actually like the picture too. Then. <laughs> <laughs> if it goes to zero, then you have at least something. Unless you, you have like. something cool. <laughs> uh, what's interesting about the NFT market is there are some that have function. Like Gary Vaynerchuk, when Gary V created his uh, V friends, there's function to it. You could buy tickets to VCon only through having an NFT. You can buy FaceTimes with him. You can buy Zooms with him. You can play basketball with him in New York City. That has function. The NFT from that perspective, I don't think will ever go away because people will always have functional NFTs. But buying something that just has a cool parrot on it, you're not gonna get 12 grand for a parrot anymore. Sure. That's what I think is gonna be different about our market. Okay, so we talked a bit about making money, a little bit about investing. Sometimes there's investments that you make that are for personal relationship. Like with Jake Paul, maybe that was for, at first you were doing it for fun to be a part of it. If it worked out great, if it didn't, it wasn't going to hurt you. How do you make that decision of, I'm into this for just making like a base hit. I want to make a small return. This one, I want a home run or this one. 
I'm going to invest deeper. This is my grand slam. Yeah, I try not to overthink it. You know, I just take it based on just the fundamentals mostly. But times at times you're investing in something, it's a cost of entry. So if you want to get into a group, you know, that you want access of, yep. you know, sometimes you might go in and the investment might go south, but what you're going to gain on connections and things like that could go the opposite way. So you just have to judge everything based on your own personal, yep. you know, personal situation. I just like to do things also with my friends. I've done some things with you, done yep. some things with Travis. Yep. It's been a lot of fun and I just like to do it. It's also a good communal thing to do together. Yep. It's a fun thing, good or bad. It's still fun to, you know, to do it with people you care about. Right. So let's change the topic for a minute. You've been spending a lot of time with in the college scene uh, supporting a team out there. Why do you spend so much time supporting the team, bringing characters, bringing celebrities and athlete friends of yours to the team? And what's the concept behind it? Um, well, it's my home. It's my home. And we live in a small area in upstate New York. And, you know, we have the worst weather up there. There's not <laughs> a lot of excitement up there. The economy is tough up there for people. So I just like to bring things that, you know, make people happy. That area has allowed me to, to make a good living and to be able to do some great things. And I just try to bring some things back. I didn't go to that school, the school that, you know, I do a lot of the stuff with, I, I couldn't get in. So like, um, but it's, it's just a place that a lot of people go and congregate and it's fun bringing people in so everybody can enjoy it. Do you believe in work life balance? Yeah, I think I got that going now. I don't think I always had it, you know, um, you know, it's been, again, you know, life is pretty crazy. You know, I, had ups. I was in prison for a while. So when you go from prison, then you have your highs, you have your lows. As long as you have, you're happy and around good people, I'm okay with it. You know what I mean? Sometimes I'm grinding, like lately I'm grinding it out so much. I'm like beat up all the time. But uh, I mean, as long as you're happy and around good, like I'm happy to be here. I haven't seen you guys in a while, so it's good. You know, so. so you've built up millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of followers and you get bombarded with requests. You know, people message you to invest in things for meetings. Can I pick your brain? All those type of things. How do you deal with it when there's hundreds of requests or thousands of requests that are coming in of people wanting your time, energy, or money? Well, it's, it's, you know, it's spread out, but you know, I have a good team of assistants. I answer every DM every day. So they all have my password. So in the morning we start like early in the morning. So they'll read me the question. I'll answer. We just keep going on in circles. Wow. We do it for about four hours a day. Six wow. days a week. Come so, on. Yeah. It's tough. It's Beautiful. tough, but come on. <laughs> yeah. Every single, every single thing. Cause Whoa. some people are, will, some people will message, how do I know this is you? And then I'll screenshot. I'll do, yeah. No, I'll do a picture. I'll send a picture like this. Or something stupid. Or something like Hi, Johnny 444. But no, most people, you know, most people have really, a lot of people just, there's a lot of people right now. I don't know if it's COVID or what happened. A lot of people are, the economy's tough. Sure. A lot of people just need a little, like a uh, little boost. You know, you're really motivational. Like that's your whole, Thing is you're always pushing people yeah. you are so I just give a little like one-liner boost to someone if they really know it's you can really you know people just want to be heard yes and who's gonna believe your bullshit if you don't take the time for other people you can sit and you can spew and, and spew it away but if you're not gonna let other people be heard I don't think you know they're ever gonna take you serious Tarzan you have thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of comments on your posts I, I can't even imagine your DMs. I don't even want to, I don't really understand it. Like when you have that many millions of followers on every different platform, how do you deal with the interactions and wanting to do what Adam was talking about, but it takes time. It takes hours in a day. How do you decide how you're going to sit there and respond to comments, good or bad? Well, most of the time I can't really reply to all comments and DMs, but I do like to uh, put the little questions thing up in my story. People can ask me questions and I'll spend about twice a month answering tons of questions. So some days I post like, five little posts on my story and then some days i have like 40 posts just answering <laughs> questions all day you know i do a q a on instagram live sometimes um mainly when i'm out of the country you know it's like flip flop so i'll be you know 10 o'clock in the morning somewhere and it's like 10 p.m over here but it's like where are you at you know and you're just answering questions you know like who got any questions let's talk so on and so forth so that's how i like to reach out and also in person i love in person conversations because i used to be uh real introverted for a long time with animals, you know? So I had just a lot of solitary time with little creatures that didn't talk to me, you know? So when I had public interactions, I was like really shy at first. So one thing I wanted to do was like, you know, reach out more and talk more to people so I can be more, you know, verbal and just, you know, more more friendly. 
he's really accessible to people people who were in Africa like you think in Africa people are coming up to it was for the, sure it was the craziest thing but what I like about him is he's so accessible me I'm more of a hermit you know what I'm saying like <laughs> you know I'm like the aviator guy in my own room just sitting there by myself but what I like about him is he takes the time for everybody and you can see like the fans yes just like he makes the, it changes their whole day yeah see their smile they're walking away Pointing back with their parents, say, oh, you yeah. Know, so that's I love that. Yeah, so. we're at the airport yesterday, and thirty-seven different people stopped him, and he stopped to take a picture with every single person. It's hard to walk anywhere with yes. him. It's a, it it's is hard to walk. A ten-minute <laughs> walk. walk. It's an hour walk wherever you go. The only time we had free time was in the jungle, like, <laughs> looking at gorillas and stuff. Yeah. That's the only time. Oh, oh, like, come here, come here. <laughs> <laughs> take a picture with crazy, you. Man. <laughs> I love you guys. Okay, so Adam, let's talk about real estate. You've got some of the coolest condos ever you've also invested in digital real estate we did a million dollar investment into big time to buy metaverse real estate to buy land all over big time in the real life world in miami new york etc how do you decide some of these marquee properties that you bought as investments and why do you like the real estate market oh um, i don't know if i ever really did it for an investment you know i love miami i, I love here my parents live here so i wanted to be close to them so i just took my time and found something that you know resonated with me and you know there's some like really great things down here. And yeah. I just took the time and just was patient and get emotional. And then, you know, you can find the things that really, really click with you. But I love, I love real estate. Are there other cities that you'd like to get real estate in? It's, it's, there's not like a big plan, you know, um, my, my friend Kelly and I are, uh, we're opening a hospitality group in uh, Paris. Fancy. So I'd That's like to, fancy. yeah, I'd like to get, uh, you know, a place in Paris nice. you know, to go. So, Know, when that goes we should be open in about eight months the first restaurant very so, cool yeah so that's gonna be a really big project yeah. so when thinking about the diverse investments 41 different investments and board advisor etc how do you decide on a hospitality group um, again just I just wanted to be in that space you know right now I have um, six restaurants right now that are all nonprofit but this is different this will be this is a profit based but, um, hold on you got to explain this to people you have six restaurants that are non-profit what on earth does that mean yeah all the money goes to women's and children's charities Love for that, all man. the restaurants oh so they're actually pretty cool like there's uh, sushi mexican you know farm to table um it's italian uh, where are these restaurants yeah. at I want, people, I want people to go there they're in upstate new york <laughs> you know they're all in, so uh, people go to these restaurants the profits are going to go to yeah, charity so we give all the money away and those so it's uh it's good because you're feeding people people are coming in eating but with that money you're feeding people in return so it's it's pretty cool and the area's been really great you know the restaurants are really crazy busy there so the the, the people that come it's part tourist part locals so it's a good sure. a good mix of the two can you say a couple of names because i want people to go there we get millions of listeners here i want people to go to upstate new york go to these restaurants support <laughs> this this is amazing <laughs> and i don't want to i don't want like uh hype anything up it's just one's elephant and dove which is krebs which is restaurant's been there a hundred years a hundred years yeah it's uh come on yeah, it's been, <laughs> yeah i think we're the the second own the second family that's owned it yeah so they had passed away so sure we took it over that um hidden fish which is sushi sushi yeah clover it's a diner named after my daughter she works there so She's That's it so there. cool, so, man. Yeah, it's fun. Her it's first fun. job is at her own restaurant. Yeah, she's <laughs> <laughs> it's, awesome. it's not so glamorous as you think. Well, Hard work. Hard work. It's glamorous for like one day. Yeah. And the rest of it. It's just, you know. I can know. All right, so let's go to the charity side. So we talked about, about making money, investing money. Now let's talk about giving money away. You have a lot of options. There are so many tens of thousands of charities that are out there. How do you decide what charities to get behind financially or personal brand wise? A lot of them are like smaller charities, uh, food kitchens, churches, uh, again, food pantries, battered women's shelter. It's like, a, a, you know, it's just a huge cross variation. But what we do is uh, one of the things we do, my daughter started is a Southern Tier Tuesday, Central New York Tuesdays. So she gets a grant every week to two geographic areas. People vote on which charity. Uh, but it, it, it gives a lot to the, some of the smaller charities. But on top of that, because I do it on my social media, it gives a lot of um, needed exposure. Sure. To, you know, you have great charities like the Red Cross and, right. and you know, American Cancer Society. Those are all great. Right. But they have you know, billions of dollars. Yeah. They have a lot. So these are a lot of the ones we do are on the local scale. You know, a church might need a handicapped access. You right. know, this synagogue might need a library, things like that. But 
we just, you know, it's just spread across to, uh, to try to directly help as many people as possible without incurring the administrative costs that a lot of the donations to sure. some of the larger charities, you know, the administration costs eat up 90% and then 10% go to the people. And I try to stay away from, I try to circumvent that. Yeah. And social media helps you because you can really dive in, you know, animal rescue is a huge one that we do, you know, so work in uh africa when we went i mean this man was just you know it was beautiful seeing you you know there's one thing to go to like giraffe manor and let's go see gorillas but we went to that real rough part of kenya and uh you, you know you gave all of you know it was like two years worth of food and you know running water to the kids and their books and we did their schooling yeah, it was great was, man was that was great. A, that was an eye-opener you know when, yeah. when i walked there like kenya it was rough it was rough like, i've never seen anything that rough. was the rough like dangerous rough like surprisingly dangerous yeah, and rough, rough. Like, uh, and there's no like electricity so it's like dark it's not like there's like street lights and everything right. it was dark but we went to he and i found this school um this crazy school and, and it was funny because they were they let us in the school and i was just sitting in the back i'm a little shy so i was talking to one of the teachers there and i'm like oh how much does it what do you make like what does the teacher make here he's like she's like it was during COVID, and yep. they're like oh we haven't been paid in nine months oh. But there in Africa, they still the teachers still show up every day. Gosh. There's yeah. no like strikes or anything. Right. They're just like working. The kids look so happy. And I go, what's the budget of this school? And they're like, uh, she goes, uh, fifty thousand. I'm like, fifty thousand a week. How many kids you got? She goes, no, no, fifty thousand for the whole year. The I go, whole year. how many? There's like a couple hundred kids in that yeah. school. I go, fifty thousand dollars for the whole. And then I'm thinking like so guilty because I had just right. bought a car or something. Right. I'm like, that's five years of this school. Right. And then um. We did something where um, we, we gave uh, 250000 to uh, keep the school open Half for five years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you just think, like, I'm not knocking $250,000 because it's a lot, but of course. we spend, you know, yeah. we spend money on things that, yeah. you know. Don't matter like that. That don't matter at all. Like, it's stupid. You yeah. buy a car that you hardly drive or, right. you, you know, you know, stuff like that. So it was just really inspirational because he and I were talking to the kids and the kids are all so happy and they have nothing. Right. Yeah. Nothing right. is Man. like Smiling nothing. And, yeah. and they're drinking, they're like for lunch, it's this big vat of like porridge crap. Like, and they're like happy and smiling and they all love him. And it was just, uh, it was just a great, it was like a great moment. Yeah, man. Everybody was touched. Yeah. And we were like with some girls uh, that were friends of ours from there. And even some of those girls were That's like cool. tough and they were all crying. <laughs> everybody was yeah, crying. Everybody was just yeah, like, man. you know, the toughest people broke at that place. Right. You yeah. Know? So one third of the Money Mondays is about charity because of this, because we, we want people to do more charity. And even your initial reaction when I mentioned talking about the restaurants and the charity, you didn't want to promote it. We have this thing where we grew up thinking that it's rude to talk about money. That's the concept of this podcast. We think it's rude to talk about charity, like it takes it away if we talk about it. The reason that I want to promote it is I want people to do more of it. And very unabashedly, I want people to do more charity. I think that they have to do more charity. I think that people make a lot of money. And they don't realize how much a little bit of money would help this earth. And if we all collectively put in a little bit of money, it becomes a massive scale. And so I'm not going to be shy asking people to donate and not to my charity. I don't want, I don't, I literally don't even ever raise money for my charity the last 10 years. I always tell people I self fund my charity. I want you to replicate my charity in yourself. My charity makes backpacks for the homeless. You don't need me. You can make backpacks for the homeless. You can fill up Ziploc bags for the homeless. You can make supplies for the homeless. We do. That toy thing you did was the craziest thing of all time. <laughs> yeah. That was the craziest <laughs> philanthropic thing I've ever. That, no, that was just like because I remember when you first started talking about yeah. it. I'm like, oh, cool, he's gonna get like a like a truckload of stuff. Right. I was like, oh, maybe he's gonna get like a, a van. Char- no, but I was yeah. like, well, that's cool. Get yeah. a whole van char. Then all of a sudden he's like, he said the word stadium. I'm like, huh? <laughs> so by so stadium. Then he said something different. <laughs> you know? Nine uh, years ago, that charity started where we were on the floor with eight of us just wrapping toys toys and 300 families would show up the next day and we'd give out toys that we wrapped the next year there was 20 of us the next year 30 40 etc now this will be our 10th year we literally have hundreds and hundreds of volunteers that if i show up it doesn't even matter i don't need to be there because there's so many volunteers and it just comes from time math that compounds yeah if you just rally the community that didn't take a bunch of money the biggest thing we talk about on the money mondays for the charity element it's not about the money part the time energy and passion and rallying your community together is what can help you do charity. I'll give you guys some quick examples. We do a report card day with what's called Trina's Kids Foundation. Trina's Kids Foundation is 300 families, downtown Los Angeles. Report card day is the kids bring the report card. Based on the A's, B's, or C's, they get cooler presents if you get an A. 
kind of good presence with a B. With a C, you're going to get some, sh some shoes and a haircut. But we want you to go get their B's and A's so we can give you laptops and iPads and cool stuff. Then there's back to school day. It's not a bunch of money involved in this. The community gets together. We get hundreds of donations. And we give them backpacks, school supplies, etc. Things that you think, oh, anybody can afford school supplies. No, they can't. Just like you just said, they're drinking out of porridge. Same concept. Downtown LA, they can't afford pencils, pens, basic supplies. Thanksgiving food drive. Anyone listening can do a Thanksgiving food drive without $1. You need to find a warehouse, an art gallery, a car, a car studio, car showroom, someone's office building, the back parking lot, and just say, everyone come to this parking lot Saturday, November 20th, right before the Thursday Thanksgiving, and bring cranberry sauce, Thanksgiving stuffing, bread, cranberry juice, etc., and people will love you for it. It won't take you $1. Toy drive. You do not need money to throw a toy drive if you are listening to me. All you need is location, flyers, social media, and rally say, hey, Tarzan, will you bring some toys? Sure, I will. Hey, Adam Weitzman, can you bring some toys? Of course I will. Hey, Adam, could you actually put a flyer up in your office and ask your employees to bring one toy each? Sure, I'll put up a flyer for you. Did any of that cost any money? Yeah. It takes time, energy, and rallying people together. That's why we have such a segment about <coughs> Money Mondays is for people to give things to charity even if it doesn't have money yet. Yeah. All right, last part. When you're doing these charity things, when you're rallying the friends together, why do you think it's important for humans or for businesses to add charity elements to their personal life or their business life? I just think it's like morally what you're supposed to do. I don't think there's like a big plan for it. I just think, you know, all of us in this room, we have probably more than we really should have. You know, look at now, you're going to be opening up this huge place. You know, just five years ago, you would never, you never really had your it. smaller place yeah. like in Florida. Now it's like this crazy, like yeah. Disney of animals <laughs> coming up. And it's just like, we, it's kind of like our obligation, sadly enough, to, that we should just, we, we should automatically be doing it. It shouldn't take too much thought. It should be already in here. Yeah. I was greedy when I was younger. So this was a, this was like a morphing process. Because when I was younger, all I cared about was myself. I didn't care about charity. It was only about whatever like just enrich me that's all i cared about but as you get older you know you sort of change and you, you know you, stuff in life makes you a little more humble and stuff like that so. so for the people listening how do we also get our family friends or community to get behind charity not necessarily the charities that we throw but how do we get them to rally the troops i don't know i think people want to are inside just got to get out of him like i remember one day like i was Dan Balziri called me and he was, Dan was just like, oh, I want to do something for kids. Let's, let's put something together for yeah. like make wish or something like that. And like people always ask me, oh, what's Dan Balzerian like when you're talking to him? And they're like, is he talking about girls? Is he talking about like whatever? And you know, a lot of times the guy's just talking about, people don't see that side of him. Yeah, he doesn't show it. I they don't that see question. that side. He's yeah. very like quiet about it. Yeah. He's not all hyping it up, yeah. you know? But the guy's like talking to me, Adam, let's do something. I saw you did this thing for make a wish. Yeah. You want to do something let's like buy a truck of toys. Yeah. yeah. Or like maybe we can he literally you know, did it. Bring I watched the monster truck there, or the, yeah. his, whatever the, those crazy trucks. Yeah. yeah. Maybe we can bring some kids out here and fly them in on the jet and everything like that. And like no one would ever see that side. Yep. You know, and that's what I always thought. That's, you know, what I always thought Dan was extra cool is because yeah. that kind of stuff is like legendary stuff that he doesn't tell anybody. Yep. That was one of the questions I asked him was, we were there, and this was before he was he was Dan Bilzerian, but he wasn't like Dan Bilzerian, right? Was yeah. not hundreds of millions of views type. And he did a post where he said, "I'm going to donate ten thousand dollars to ten different families. Comment below your best stories." There was like seventeen thousand comments in the first hour, and then you're like heart wrenching stories, you're like, "Oh my god, yeah. single mom, this with three kids. This lady had her husband passed away. This happened here." That's... He never talked about the fact. He had ended up hiring a whole team to go through it, and he donated ten thousand dollars to so many people. Yeah, it wasn't ten, it wasn't a hundred, it was a lot more than that. Yeah. Never talked about it, and even when I brought it up to him, he didn't want to talk about it because inside he wanted to do it. And I, my goal is to have these discussions where people go out there and whether they do it publicly, quietly, etc. Just do it. Just do it. Jake Paul's like that too, though. Oh Doing yeah. Thing for the bullies, thing he's out there doing charities. Like I'll be at the fair, and some kid will come up to me, and I. You know, be some kid that's like really sick. Like for one of the things I'm doing, like, oh, you know, Jake Paul, can I talk to him? You FaceTime, <laughs> FaceTime him. You FaceTime him. He answers every single time. Right. He could be in the gym. He could be with his girl. He could be yeah. whatever. Yeah. He that guy. He'd be training. He answers every single time. And there's some people just there's just people just like that. You know what I mean? Yep. So All right, ladies and gentlemen, you just listened to Adam Weitzman, the real Tarzan. We do have a favor request at the end of each episode. Because we grew up thinking it's rude to talk about money is why we think there's a lot of financial hurt and a lot of uh, 
misinformation that's out there because we don't get to talk about what salary to ask for. Should I rent an apartment? Should I lease an apartment? Should I rent a car? Should I lease a car? Should I finance, get a mortgage? FICO score, I can't spell FICO. We don't know these things because we don't have these discussions. So I think it's really important for us. If you like this episode or any episode, please share it with your friends. Make sure to go follow Adam Weitzman, follow his fun journey through life as he helps people in crates, restaurants, no profit, just donate the money out there. <laughs> follow Tarzan for all of his great animal content and we'll see you guys soon. Peace. gentlemen welcome to a, another edition of the money mondays today we have a guest that i've known for many 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 years uh, every time i see him i smile and every time i see him he is smiling because this is one of the happiest humans i know i've watched him grow himself from being an influencer speaker to all of a sudden working out with the rock getting on stage with tony robbins and everything in between he's going to blow your mind please welcome mr nick santanastasso my man Woo! in the crowd Thanks for having me. All right, we are co-hosted here by the real Tarzan. <laughs> All right, Nick. So the way it works is we talk about three main things. We do exactly 40 minutes because people work out for around 45 minutes. They drive for around 45 minutes to work. And so we made a 40-minute podcast to make it nice and easy for people to listen to. We only talk about three core topics. How to make money, how to invest money, how to give some away to charity. Perfect. So before that, give us like a two-minute bio about Nick, and then we'll get straight to the money. Great. Uh, so 26 years old in 1996, I was born with a super rare genetic disorder called Hanhart syndrome, which either leaves the babies with undeveloped limbs or undeveloped organs. Um, I had about a 30% chance to live. And when I was born, the only thing that was affected were my limbs. Um, so I'm beautiful. I have no legs, one arm and one finger, and all my organs were 100% healthy. And, uh, you know, had to figure out how to survive with no legs, one arm. I got beat up like my sibling, beat up by my siblings, just like everybody else. Um, became a wrestler, became a prankster. There was a lot of identity hats. Um, you probably see me running around either scaring people or inspiring <laughs> people. Um, but I've uh, elevated my identity, wore a b bunch of hats, and uh, figured out a lot of ways to make money and make an uh, impact. And so I'm glad to dive into it. That's How was so that? Cool. Two minutes. <laughs> yeah. That was the most effective bio so far. Okay. So, Nick, on the making money side, you have different verticals, right? You've done the influencer side of things. You've done the speaking side of things. You've authored a book, et cetera. How can people decide what they're going to make money in when they start to build their personal brand? Because now you've got multiple streams of income. How did you decide which ones you're going to do and which ones you're going to spend your time on? Yeah, that's great. I'm a big believer that you can only lead people as far as you're willing to be led. You can also only heal people as deep as you, you can heal yourself. Wow. And so I think one of the greatest ways that you can turn around and con condense time for other people is on your own journey. And so for me, I think it's very similar to a lot of human beings, whether they have all their legs and all their arms, is I struggle with confidence, I struggle with uh, depression or feeling suicidal or not being able to fit in, self-worth, all these different things. And so I feel like whatever path that you've walked, life has already qualified you to turn around and condense time for others. And I think oftentimes there's a misconception of leading and coaching others. You think you have to be like a million steps ahead to be an authority, when in reality, you just need to be a few steps or a few hops in front of someone in order to turn around and condense time for them. And so I think if people wanna understand who they can serve and how they can make an impact and how they can make income, that your who is you a few years ago. Right, so where were you five years ago? Where were you three years ago? What were you struggling with? What was the path that you walked? What were the things that you had to overcome? And because of you, because you went through those things, you can turn around and then help people get there from A to Z very quickly. And so I think everybody needs a little baby Yoda in their life <laughs> because when you're in the game, you can only see what you can see and you can only hear what you can hear. So you need a little baby Yoda flying 30,000 feet above the air so they can see things that you can't. When did you decide it was time to get on stage? I'm going to speak. I'm going to tell my story. I'm going to inspire people. I'm going to teach them to be better. When was that turning point? Yeah, this is a great question. Well, I think there's many different stages, which by the stages changed my life. But I think oftentimes people think when they think stages, they think of like getting on stage in an in a actual room. And so for me, Internet was my first stage. And yeah. I think that's one of the greatest stages that everybody has in their pocket or on their laptop. You have a stage that is accessible to you. And so I was on the news here and there, like being 13, and they brought me on the Today Show, and that was really amazing. Um, but I think my big, my biggest and my first stage was the app Vine. 
and Vine was an app that was released in 2014 where you can post six second videos. Y'all remember Vine? Oh, yeah. And uh, you had to be as creative as you can in six seconds. And I was coming out of, at this point, I was 17, 18 years old. I just became a wrestler. I was just starting to get confidence. And um, I was like, I want to create something that has never been done before that no one can replicate. So I'm immediately the king of it. And it can make people laugh and it can inspire them at the same time. And so I sat with my friends and I was like, hey, I got an idea. They're like, well, what is it? And I'm like, well, what if I dress up as a legless zombie and I crawl around Walmart scaring people? Do you think it would work? And they're like, oh, I've never seen it done. I'm like, great. This is exactly what the internet needs. And so I was a senior in high school. I put fake blood on my face and I put fake blood on my clothes and I set out to my local Walmart in New Jersey, which Nick's not allowed at that Walmart anymore. <laughs> and uh, we're going down the aisles looking for the first victim. And uh, I see this guy is heavily invested in the paper towels. And I told my camera guy I was going to try to scare this guy. And I crawled around the corner going Rah! and uh, he threw the paper towels at my face and he got really scared and I captured this all in six seconds and my goal was to post this on Vine the stage um, and have 500 people see it and I posted that video I went to sleep and for school the next morning and I woke up and it was the number one video on Vine oh my Logan gosh. Paul texted me like it was it was <laughs> crazy yeah. Logan had no idea who I was yeah. I didn't really know who Logan was this was back in the day and um, that year, I was like, oh, I'm on to something because I think we can all agree in life and in business, one of the first things that I look for is proof of concept. My first yes, my first like, my first engagement because if I can do it once, I could do it a million times. And so I was like, okay, I'm gonna do some pranks here without like trying to get, I don't wanna get shot or anything or kicked right. in the head or anything, right? And so I did these pranks in my senior year of high school and gained one million followers and created my own stage, wow. which led me to The Walking Dead hiring me to scare Norman Reedus in Tokyo, <laughs> Japan as uh, the zombie. And that was my first gig. They paid me 10 grand. <laughs> so <funny. Wow. laughs> That's how I got started, scaring people in Walmart. Tarzan, now you're getting 200 million views a month. When did you first get the first 200 views? Man, uh, just like Nick, you know, I had these crazy <laughs> ideas of, you know, doing odd stuff. And I was like, man, let me let me actually post it and see what happens. So I had a I had a chameleon in my hand and I put a, a cricket in my mouth and they have these long tongues. I put it up and it <laughs> stuck its tongue out and grabbed the cricket. Mm -hmm. And I posted it. It's got you know like like seven hundred views. Right. You know, and then someone else reposted it and it got like seven hundred thousand views in oh. a day. And I was like, <laughs> What? This, this is <laughs> like go. this is day this is like <laughs> five, six, seven years ago, you know? And I'm like, man, so it started going viral and after that I had the bug. You know, and then I sent the picture. Uh, I, I sent the video um, on my page. I had a, this big, huge, same giant anaconda, and I was taking a bath with it. And it was like, <laughs> it's in a bathtub, and I had like a rubber ducky in there, and I'm like, kicking the anaconda over. I'm like, dude, Move scoot over. over. Yeah. You know, you're hogging up all the space, and I wow. pan the camera, and it's this giant snake in the tub. And I had like suds on my, I put like suds on my head and stuff like that. I'm like. He's always hogging all the space out. People are like, bro, you're in the wow. bathtub. <laughs> well, the anaconda, you know. And then Worldstar posted it, and then like, the rest is history. The rest is history, man. It was just. So your first viral video was kissing a chameleon. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> let's go. Kissing chameleon. That's so inspiring, then, though, man. I love thank it. Thank you, brother. When did you go from speaking at an event for free to actually asking to charge for speaking? Because I think a lot of people are Ooh. nervous. Oh, yeah, that's a that's a great question. I'll start off with this. You'll never make more than you think you're worth. And for a lot of us, for a lot of us that are successful, a lot of our success and what we built comes from trying to fill a void of love me. Am I enough? Can you accept me? Am I good enough in the world? And so I love this answer because, um, you know, Wes was talking about a perception is projection. However you perceive yourself, you're going to project into the world. And so if you don't think you're worth a keynote fee, you're not going to get a, key, uh, a keynote fee. And I always tell people, what's the difference between selling a thousand dollar product between selling a ten thousand dollar product? It's adding a comma and adding a zero and get someone to say yes. It's it's all fake. It's all this illusion. And so. I would do free speaking engagements, which by the way, I, I, I never wanted to be a speaker. I didn't know that speaking was on this, this, this industry and people were doing it. And I actually saw a guy, his name is Nick Voyagek, and a lot of people get us mixed up. I'm the more handsome one, sorry. Um, and he's an Australian uh, pastor. And my dad showed him, showed me to him one time, and I saw him speak in a church in New York when I was 13, and it was proof of concept that, wow, someone who has no arms and no legs is a speaker. And so I didn't know anything about speaking, and when I moved to Tampa from Jersey to become a bodybuilder, I was in a small mastermind, it was like eight people, and I started sharing my story, and after I was done sharing my story, there was a guy on the couch and said, you're gonna be on stage with Tony Robbins one day. 
And I was like, who's Tony Robbins? I had no <laughs> idea anything about personal development. Right. And that was Ratmir, who's here behind the scenes. And he saw a gift in me that I didn't see myself. And he said, I'm going to work for you for free. And maybe one day we'll start a company together. And that was five years later, two seven-figure companies and a world tour of Tony Robbins. But we start just to give some context <laughs> here, right? So just to give some context. <laughs> and so I spoke a lot for free. And this is a very good skill because oftentimes the ego gets in the way. It's like, no, I need to be paid for my time. I need to get paid for my work. Especially the ego gets in the way even when you didn't get your stripes or you don't even have enough reps under your belt. And so I spoke a lot for free. And actually, my first paid speaking engagement was a car dealership in Tampa, Florida. And I got paid $1,500 for an hour. And I'm like, I'm rich. Yeah, I'm rich. Literally. Done. Yeah. Mom, retire. Yeah, Everybody, we're going to Disney World. Like, whatever. Yeah. I looked at Ratmir. I'm like, bro, we ain't never going broke. <laughs> right? I just opened my mouth and I breathed and I talked. And they paid me 1500 bucks. I was like, this is amazing. Yeah. We have a picture of Ratmir. He's like holding up the check. We were so proud. <laughs> and um, they were like, our, our, our sales team had a record record month the next month. I'm like, this is amazing. And I don't know if they were just hyping yeah. me up. I don't even know if it was real or not, but I was like, this is amazing. And so from there, we started modeling or learning from those that had massive success in the industry, like learning from Tony's, learning from the Ed Milet's, like anyone who is prevalent and dominant in the speaking world, we started to study everything about them. And so I went from a, a free speaker to a paid speaker when I got the, the, the moxie or I got the confidence to say, hey, this is the fee and this is what it is and just hope they would say yes. And so that was the transition. But for everyone listening out there, like if you want to make a jump in your impact and you want to make a jump in your income, all it takes is someone on the other side of that phone call to say yes and your life will, will never be the same. Wow. I love it. Okay. So speaking, we talked a bit about making money there. Coaching. When do people go from giving free advice, coaching a little bit, to being an expert enough or being qualified enough to actually charge for coaching? Yeah, I think there's a, there's a few variables. I think you start charging when you realize you're doing your clients a disservice by giving them information for free. If people don't pay, they don't pay attention. So you, you can lay down the, Dan Fleischman could lay down the playbook to make $100 million and if they don't pay for it, they ain't gonna take action on it. And so a lot of coaches out here are actually falling short or they're doing their people a disservice because they're not charging enough. And so I think first you have to just start charging, but also I think one of the greatest skills that I developed and from going to speaking and coaching is digging my well deep on my specific expertise or a specific niche, right? And my mentor told me, he said, you should know 50 times more than anyone can ever ask you in the moment. Hmm. You should never be able to run out of content. And, and if you never run out of content and answers, you will always be positioned as the expert in the authority. And because you're the ex expert in the authority, people will pay you as much money as you want. And so I think oftentimes this, we talk about imposter syndrome, right? That fear, imposter syndrome, I don't fit in. Oftentimes imposter syndrome is you not being competent enough. You don't know enough about your subject, so you feel like a fraud and you don't want someone to ask you a question that you don't have the answer for. And so if you want to start coaching and if you want to start getting paid, go really deep on a specific subject where no one can out debate you and no one can out talk you in that. And I think when it comes to overcoming adversity and unwiring and rewiring the, the mind, I'm top, I'm top five. Um, and that's because I have a unique body that I've had to live life with and I have a unique perspective, but I've also dedicated the past five to six years of my life learning from the greatest minds in the world. And so I got into, co I was forced into coaching. And what I mean by that is before COVID, my only business model was getting paid for speaking engagements and selling books. And I was like, this is amazing. I'm 20, 22, I'm traveling 85% of the year. I never see my family, I never see my friends, but I'm making cash and I'm making income. I'm like, I'm never gonna stop. This is amazing, I'll never get burnt out. And I got to the point where I realized, wow, I either learn how to clone myself or I figure out a new business model because this isn't scalable. Right. I'm still trading time for money and we'll talk about that. And so I was like, okay, what if we move to Vegas and we build relationships with all the, the hotels, I won't have to travel and all the events come to me. And so February of 2020, I moved my company to Vegas, oh not God. knowing that everything was gonna get shit on, everything March. was gonna fall down, right? Yeah, and March. so, yeah. In, in two weeks, right? Two weeks to flatten the curve. Uh, in two weeks, <laughs> I saw hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars fall. And, and that was money that we probably all already celebrated, rookie move, right? Never celebrate money until the bank account. I'm like, yeah. dude, we got all these contracts. This is amazing. We could chill, right? And then all the money's gone. And so there, are t there were two types of people during that phase of COVID. The, one, the first person was like, I'm gonna wait till the world comes back to normal. Right. And they got screwed. 
And then the other per person was like, I need to pivot, I need to adapt, and I need to see what the world's doing so I can pick up on this. And so there was probably like a week or two weeks of like, oh shit, like there was like fear, like what are we gonna do? We're about to go bankrupt, wasn't prepared for that, just moved all the expenses and all the company to Vegas, and we were in a very scary spot. And what did I do? I, lo I looked to Tony, looked to the best in the world. They said, what is this guy doing? He's got his whole event company is based off of events, what is he doing? And he started doing these challenges and these yeah. four hour workshops, and that was, enough leverage and enough pain for me to say, okay, I need to figure out this digital marketing, click funnel, all this different type of stuff. I need to figure out funnels and coaching or else I'm going to not be able to impact lives and I'm gonna go broke. And so the pain of COVID pushed me to create an online education company. Wow. I was forced, <laughs> but now it's the greatest gift I was given. So some of the most impactful people in history, the biggest views, the biggest names are The Rock and Tony Robbins. How do you go and work out with The Rock, or actually ha he asks you to work out with him, and how do you go tour with freaking Tony Robbins that that stage is priceless, and he's on the stage most of the time, so he doesn't actually need that many speakers. Like, How do you get into that elite group that they, he chooses? That's a great question. I think a few things. The first thing is dropping your ego and realizing you only know what you know. One of the biggest wealth traps that you can fall into is the know-it-all syndrome. And the moment you think you've mastered something is the very belief that's holding you back from the next level of life. And so I'm always trying to learn. The other thing that Ratmir taught me, Ratmir is like the yin to my yang, right? My ego gets really big and I got a big head sometimes and everybody claps for me and Ratmir kind of, you know, brings me back down. And not many people know this, but I, I worked for Tony's foundation for two years without ever getting any compensation or any spotlight. And when we got into the speaking industry, Ratmir was like, hey, if, if we get Tony to endorse us and give us the nod, like we have everyone in the speaking, we have all the credibility. And so at our first Tony event, we couldn't afford three tickets. It was me and my two business partners, Ratmir included. And so they all pitched in for my ticket, got it upgraded to VIP, and then they volunteered and we planted seeds and Tony knew who I was and I got to meet him and he invited me to other events. And um, we kept emailing them like, hey, Nick just climbed a mountain. Hey, Nick just filmed a, a podcast. Hey, Nick just did a book and nothing, nothing, nothing. And then finally a year goes by and they're like, hey, Tony has a youth leadership program. He's not in it, but kids come to San Diego and they do uh, youth, youth exercises. Would you come speak? And I'm like, absolutely. And they're like, there's a catch though. We can't pay you, we can't fly you out, and we can't compensate you. And at first I was like, oh hell no, right? You know who I am, you know, like, I'm Nick Santos de Sasso. And Ratmir's like, yo, humble yourself, like, this is for the, the greater cause. For sure. And so I did that, I burned it down, I made a name for myself, and I and I worked under the, under the radar for two years until Tony was like, hey, we wanna test you out on UPW. And then I spoke once on UPW, he's like, I want you to go on all my UPWs. Wow. And so the lesson behind that one is to give without any expectation. I think oftentimes people fall into their, we were talking about it, very transactional relationships. And it's very like tit for tat, like you do this and I do that and it's gotta be even. But I think the person that really invests in people and gives the most value wins in the end and builds meaningful relationships, but also the the lesson of getting in the room, which Dan did a great job of talking about that in, in the event that we were at today is like, you gotta pay to get in rooms. And you gotta get in rooms that are richer and smarter than you because they're gonna allow you to condense time, but you're one handshake away, one piece of information away from changing the trajectory of your life. And talking about the law of exposure, once you're exposed, you cannot be unexposed. Right. So the truth is, the only reason why most people aren't successful is because they didn't have the right support system, they didn't have the right stages, and they weren't exposed to the information. They never knew it. You only know what you know. And so I would say get in the room, give without any expectation, and be a student of the game and learn as much as you can. How and why did The Rock ask you to work out with him? Because I have bigger legs in him, you know? So like when someone like The Rock, when I when I have bigger legs jealousy. in The Rock, yeah, exactly, 100%, yeah, just, yeah. ego. Um, no, so I, an another person on the radar, right? It's like I kind of have like a, I wouldn't say a hit list, but a, a dream 100 that you want to collaborate with. Yeah. And um, I'll throw content at them on every platform. I'll DM them with my blue check in every way and blow up their DMs until I get some attention. And for, for The Rock, I think he had seen me just through my bodybuilding videos because bodybuilding was a massive stage for me. You know, yeah. people never seen a man with no legs of an arm be better in better shape than people with all their limbs. And so I knew I would gain attention for that. And so I was in Vegas for Mr. Olympia, and there was a, a famous gym. It's a shame it's no longer there, but it was a city athletic club. And it was famous because the lighting makes you look way better than what you look like. It was perfect lighting. And I go into the gym, and there was like a few legends in there. There was The Rock, there was Kai Green, and there was C.T. Fletcher. And if you're in the fitness industry, wow. those are all legends. Yeah. Yeah. And um, 
I, I think one of my greatest skills and people, people that are networking with high level individuals, and I think you guys would attest for this, is the, the moment you make a celebrity just feel like a regular human being, they start to mess with you. They like, in a good way, like they start to connect with you. Like you don't put them on this high pedestal and, and because they want to feel like a human being. And so I saw The Rock in the gym. I was like, I'm not going to bother him. I was like, the truth is I stick out like a sore thumb. If this man knows who I am, he'll come up to me. And long and behold, we were lifting, you know, next to each other, doing curls, paying each other no mind. I didn't want to mess with his set and uh, his flow. And he had like security guards and it was the craziest yeah. thing I've ever seen. And his security guard comes up to me, goes, you're Nick, right? And I was like, well, not many, <laughs> not many people look like this, bro. I'm this handsome. I got no legs, yeah, one sure. arm. Like, I'm Nick. And he's like, Dwayne wants to meet you. He's like, can I bring him over? I'm like, yeah, yeah sure. I guess, I, I, give me a couple yeah. minutes. No, no, no. Bring him, <laughs> bring him over. And uh, he comes over and he's like, can I have a picture with you? And I'm like, oh you're so God. good with people. Yeah. You're so, I know what you're doing. You're so good with people. And he's like, I want to take a picture with you. You're amazing. And so we took a picture and um, he posted that picture and, and it blew me up. It blew me up big. I gained a couple hundred thousand followers and so social proof, you know, immediately blow up. So I was in the right place at the right time. But also I made someone who everybody fangirls over felt like a human being. And I think that's the greatest tool that you can give. Love that. Investing. Instead of talking about investing money, let's talk about investing time and energy and passion. Why should people invest into themselves? Why should they get coaches? Why should they go into masterminds? Why mm. should why should they invest in themselves? Oh, this is a great question. I think people should invest in themselves because it's the one thing that the government can't take from you. There you go. Make that a clip. <laughs> <laughs> they can take your house. I'm saying the world, Matrix, whatever you want to call it. They can take your house. They can take your family. They can take your cars. They can take your business, but they can't take the knowledge that you have inside your brain. And so it's an invaluable investment, and you will always hold that knowledge. And you can always rebuild as long as you have the knowledge. Most people can't build because they don't have the knowledge. And so it's 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 information that will go with you for the rest of your life but also the more that you invest in yourself you start to step into the identity of someone who values themselves someone who pays for information someone who's only focused on the ROI and not what they have to invest initially and that goes a long way and so not only is the investment for the coach I get the money's great right but also for you investing you're gonna you're gonna retain more information but also you're gonna step into the identity of someone who pays to to be a big player and when you pay to be a big player, you get in big rooms, you big have big conversations, and you get big networks. And so I think oftentimes one of the greatest things that's holding people back from the next level of life is their self, but also it's their identity. And so if you want to do things that are going to expand your identity, get a little bit uncomfortable, pay to get in rooms, and uh, upgrade your habits and rituals. And one of them should be investing in yourself. And necessarily, you don't even need money these days to invest in yourself. I mean, now we have a computer in our pocket. And you can go on Google and you learn some amazing things. And so I'll give the audience one one of the greatest habits that changed my life and elevated my identity was taking at least 30 to 45 minutes every single day to acquire a new skill or to expand on a skill that I already have. Because competence breeds confidence. And if I'm confident, I can make as much money as I want in the world and I can transfer that confidence to my students and they can make as much money as they want. So when it's time for someone to invest in themselves, how do they decide who to believe? Like who, who do they choose? Yeah, great. So first things first, if you want a, a leg workout, don't come to me because I don't have the results that you desire, right? Now go, go to Tarzan, right? If you want to learn how to get, uh, you know, nurture animals and build amazing things around animals, like go to you, you're the expert in that. If you want to learn with uh, money and investing, you go to Dan. And so the first thing that you need to do, and, and again, Wes said is like, be very judgmental. like is the person that I'm listening to have the life and have the results that I want? If they don't, I deflect it. Because the truth is most of you are trying to get business advice from your mom who's never built a business or grandma who's never taken any financial risk or she didn't know how. And so the first things first is like, does this person have the life and the results that I want? And the second thing is, do I align with their core values? Do I align with their beliefs? Do I align with the way that they do business? Do they have integrity? Are they are they meaningful? Are they in their heart, right? And so those are the things that I look for. And the moment that my core values and my beliefs and the way that I view the world and my impact aligns with that person, I'll pay whatever it is to, to get in their presence. I mean, Dan knows, I'll text you like, I was like, bro, I will meet you anywhere in the world, wherever you are, because I know the proximity to Dan is just in, invaluable it's 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 it allows me to condense time I've learned so much from you so that's what I would say is make sure people have the life and the results that you want so you can pay them so they can condense time so Tarzan on the animal side how do people know who's the real deal or not when it comes to animal content 
numbers don't lie, you know. Just uh, a lot of people try to do a lot of things in the animal space, but um, one of the animals, they'll they'll weed out who's real and who's not, and the numbers show a lot as well too, you know. So you know, there's a lot of copy and paste out there, um, but I encourage it because you know a lot of people need we need a thousand more Tarzans. You know, we need a thousand more people that want to care about animals, whether they have a lot of numbers or they don't. So in my opinion, um, I look at everybody as real in the animal space, you know, um, numbers or not. I know it's kind of contradicting from what I just said, but it's not about the numbers. It's about the animals, you know. And uh, if you look at the numbers and people are still doing animal content and trying to help animals, they don't have any numbers and they're still going. I see these people for the animals, you know, the people like myself that have you know all the numbers are back it up and i'm still doing the animals you know i was doing it before the numbers i do it after the numbers i do it whether you can see the numbers or not you know it's like you gotta you gotta really want what you're doing and sometimes and most of the time in this space with animals you don't get anything in return you know so nick how do you decide as a speaker an author dj whatever it is that you're doing how do you decide what to charge low price, medium price, or high price, or crazy price? Like, how do you decide how much is it to charge? That's a great question. I think, I think oftentimes, I think there's a balance to this answer here. I think oftentimes as entrepreneurs, we try to create things based off what we think people need rather than asking our people what they need and where they're at. And so one of the greatest things that I've done is just survey my audience and identify like w what income levels are they at? What are they struggling with? What What is feasible to them? Because the truth is, if I'm gonna pitch someone a $50,000 VIP day with me on stages to someone who only makes 40K, like that's not the right fit. They would be more for my mindset, my inner circle program. And so I think the first thing is getting the lay of lay of the land and really understanding who your target audience is, who, your, like, who, who you're serving. Um, and then the, I think the other thing is find like find other people that have similar products. You know, you were giving me price points on recurring models and everything because you've done it. And so find people who've already had this ascension ladder of digital products and see what price points work because they've already been tested. Like you, you're a smart person. You've already tested price points. So I would go and see people that are in the same industry and see what they're what they're offering and what their price points are. Um, but also sometimes you're afraid to throw out the 50 K's and the 100 K's. And I think there is uh, there is an elevation in your identity when you spit that number out, even if they say no, it's just like, hey, I offered a $50,000 program and I never done it before. But I want everybody to look at their value ladder as an ice cream shop, right? You like ice cream? I love ice cream, right? You look potatoes, he loves potatoes, a lot. right? I know that about you. But say we go into an ice cream shop, I love ice cream and I'm a go big or go home guy. So I'm always gonna go for a large and I'm gonna get a pint, that's what I do. And so if I went into Dan's ice cream shop and I was like, hey, I want a pint. He's like, we don't sell pints. He just missed out on a high ticket customer. Right. Now, there, now you may come in and say, Dan, I want a small. He's like, here, I got a small, right? But I would suggest that every single person has a, a, a low offer, a medium offer, and then this big whale offer because there's always going to be a person that's going to buy it. But you don't want the scenario where someone says, hey, I'll pay you 50 grand. And you're like, I don't even have anything to offer you for 50 grand. So I say have price points for all different things and really start surveying your audience and identifying their demographic, what their income level is, where they're trying to go, where they want to be to see how you can best serve their needs. Yeah, I have elevator night, which is free. I've thrown that 51 times and it's always going to be free. I have for 200 bucks a month, we have the moneymondays.com. So people can do like a virtual Zoom with us every Monday at four o'clock. We have a $20,000 mastermind, which is the Operation Black site to learn how to shoot with Navy SEALs or fight with Michael Chandler and Tim Kennedy. We have a $35,000 mastermind, which is Avengers. That's the real estate mastermind. And then we have a $100,000 mastermind, the hundred, which is called the 100 million mastermind experience. You have to have all these different price points because there's different audiences that you have. You don't know if someone can afford free, which means they can't afford anything, or they have the money, they just don't want to pay it with you. It's fine. You don't know if 200 bucks a month is like the perfect price point. Or does this person want to learn about shooting guns, real estate, or overall arching business? And so in our own world, we created all different levels of products so that people could buy whatever they wanted. I never did the one on one coaching due to time. Yep. Everyone always hits me up like, oh, I'll pay you 50 grand, 100 grand for one-on-one coaching. I'm like, I physically can't yeah. do it because there's so many moving parts to my world. Uh, maybe that'll change one day or they'll say a number that's bigger and I'll donate it all to charity. I'll do something. But you have to decide for yourself what levels you want to be at and also make sure you can back it up. 
what I'm concerned about is the amount of coaches. I call them the 19 year old life coach. They haven't lived life yet. You're 19 years old, bro. Like you're not, <laughs> you haven't lived life yet. And we see a lot of 19 year old life coaches coming out and charging $10,000 for coaching when they literally can't get it. They can't buy alcohol, you know? <laughs> and so when you're out there thinking about either getting into coaching or speaking on stage, et cetera, researching is very important. Like Nick said, research what the other speakers are charging, what other coaches are charging. Make sure you can back it up, whether it's on stage, through a coaching program, through an online course, et cetera. And then make sure you really follow through. Mm. When someone makes the leap to pay you 500 bucks, 1,000 bucks, 10,000, et cetera, make sure you back it up and, and give them what, they, what they're what they asking for and over deliver. Because if you over deliver, they'll reorder from you and they'll recommend you to their friends. 100%. So as people are progressing through their life, why do you think people are scared to ask for any money at all? Why do you think that they're scared? What's holding them back? from saying, I'm worth a thousand bucks to DJ. I'm worth $5,000 to speak. I want a $10,000 sign fee for my book, blah, blah, blah. Why do you think people are scared to ask for the check? Yeah, I think most people are scared to ask for the check or talk about money because most of their model of the world and their beliefs were cultivated between zero and seven years old when your brain was in theta state. And when you were a little boy or a little girl, you heard, we can't afford that. And money doesn't grow on trees. And rich people are evil. And they probably screwed someone over for that Lamborghini. And so at a little boy, a little girl, you believe that money was hard to make. Yep. You believe that you couldn't afford it. Or in my household in specific, money was a hush-hush topic. Yep. We don't talk about money. Don't let anyone know how much money you have or how little money you have, right? right? And so then money becomes taboo. And I love why you're, the mission of this podcast yep. is to make it uh, a, common, a common conversation, right? And so oftentimes, your relationship with money isn't yours. It got thrown onto you. Hmm. Uh, you picked it up along the way. It's not yours. And so I tell people most of your elevation and personal development is going to be coming from unlearning the BS that you've been taught by the wow. matrix and by the world and by your parents. And in no way, shape or form am I throwing stones at those who raise you because the truth is our parents did the best they could with what they knew in their conditioning. Right. And so that's why people are scared to ask for the money. You're scared to ask for the check because they've been they have a specific relationship with money and they never challenged it or growing up they never had evidence that money was uh, an important thing because no one in their family has ever made money and so the truth is oftentimes people just don't have a standard the standard hasn't been set or the standard is very average or it's below average which it's all around you and so they don't know they only know what they know and so that's why i think it's a beautiful thing about this podcast is educating people on the one tool that makes the world go round but also makes a massive impact but also a thing that people are very uncomfortable to talk about and the truth is if you Right now, if you're uncomfortable talking about money, you probably struggle with making money. You probably struggle with saving money. And those things probably were trickled down um, generations and generations. And it's your goal and your duty to be the one to break that. And that's what Dan's done. That's what you've done. And that's what you're doing with the podcast is like being the one to, to say, hey, money is great. Yes. It's a magnifier. If you're a dick, you're going to be a bigger dick. And if you're amazing, you're going to be more amazing. But let's talk about this more so you can have a better relationship with it. Absolutely. So for the last segment, we always talk about, you know, making money, investing money, and then giving away to charity. When we talk about giving away to charity, we don't necessarily always talk about the money part. We talk about the time, energy, passion, and building a community around a charity. Why is it that people are scared to talk about charity? Do you think it's the same thing from the money relation? And how do you choose charities that you would put your money, time, energy, or personal brand behind? I think people don't talk about charities maybe because this world is is this world is a very interesting place i mean i think it was jeff bezos he donated like 900 800 million dollars and the first headline was it wasn't a billion exactly right so people get shit on regardless of what they do so some people just want to be private with their philanthropy or the things that they do so i think uh it's a very sensitive world so sometimes people are tiptoeing and then maybe some people aren't talking about charity because they ain't got the cash to give the charity right so they feel uncomfortable about it um when I pick charities, it, go, it goes back to business partners and relationships as well. I look for things that align. I think I, uh, I want to align with their values. I want to align with their mission. And it probably hits home. And so, for example, there's a few charities that I donate to and that I'm a part of. The first one is I sit on the board of a nonprofit called Roar. And this is a foundation that built my adaptive snowboard that gave me the gift of independence and mobility on, on, a, on a mountain. I get to run. I got no legs. I get to shred down the, the hmm. slope. And so they gave me the gift of mobility and now we have a nonprofit where we put limb different people on snowboards and we raise the money we get investors and sponsors and then we go do a trip I just got back from Colorado so that's one of them and then the other one is um, I got to go to Mexico with my buddy Brad and we gave out 
they, we built a hundred wheelchairs and gave them to, nice. um, you know, people that can't afford, they've never seen wheelchair in a 60 years, right? It's been 60 years. They were carrying around by their family member wow. and we get to give them the gift of mobility and independence and you see their face. And so that hits home for me because when I was born, there was a lot of medical expenses and wheelchairs and there was a group of people who raised money to help my family. And so I want to give that back. And so I look for things that are close to home and I look for things that align. And I think I look for, and, and by the way, th those that are wondering about philanthropy and charity, like, that that impact is for them but it makes a whole bigger impact on you yeah it's it actually heals you way deeper than you think and so there's two things that every single human being needs to do in order to live a fulfilled life the first one is growth you're either growing or you're dying and the second one is contribution and i think that with money the reason why we make so much money we want to make so much money is so we can give it back and do amazing things in the world ladies and gentlemen you have listened to nick santanastasso we're going to bring him back multiple times because he's one of the best humans in history uh, we are co-hosted here with The Real Tarzan. Make sure you follow them both on social media. And we have one request at the end of each episode. The moneymondays.com to us is very important because, as Nick mentioned, we grew up thinking it's rude to talk about money. It's taboo. Mm. And the whole point of this podcast is to realize it's not. Money is not the root of all evil. Money is important to talk about. People need to hear about salaries, apartments, rent, mortgages, loans, FICO scores, debt, equity, and everything in between. And that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to keep talking about and so if you guys can help us keep sharing this podcast, like, comment, review, forward it to your friends that also want to talk about money, have discussions in your home, household and offices about money. It's very important for our country. It's very important for your life. Thank you. My name is Dan Fleischman. We'll see you next Monday. Peace.